And that video caught my eye because truly um, we are in a season that we have not been in. And, and, and us, a lot of us as individuals as well as a, a church body. Um, and and as, I, I truly am just amazed at God as we go through this sun stand still. I mean, the majority of my life I was a strong starter. So I got excited from the get-go. But as time went on, I began to fizzle out. Other things got my attention. As you heard Matt say, I mean, life is life, but when you make a commitment and a decision um, to, to go forward in what God is asking you to do, you better, you better almost come to conclusion that it's going to get tested. Things are going to come up. Things are going to distract you. And, and the different thing is for a guy that's never really stuck with anything, and if you take that in conjunction with my ADD, if there's anything shining to the left or right of me, I'm easily distracted in that direction. And I'm not really ever a focused person until I got to know God on a real personal level because God promises us once he starts something, he will complete it. God says that I'm going to call you and then I'm going to equip you. And I, and I love these particular chapters this week because they were talking talking about fear and, and different things. And I believe when, when God calls you out of the boat into unfamiliar territory, the, the book of Isaiah says that I will lead the blind in ways they do not know. Alongside unfamiliar paths, I will guide them. Let me tell you something, church. We're in an unfamiliar path. Let me tell you something, church, that we are not in a place that we've been before, but our God is already there. It's very important as our faith gets stretched at the capacity that God is calling it to, that we need to be in unity, and we are in unity. We need not only to sit back, we need to step up. God is wanting and he's willing to do whatever it is that he will do in and through us, but a lot of that depends on us. A lot of that depends on us, and for me, it's taken pretty much the majority of my life to stick with it, you know, and, and, and between myself and the enemy called the devil, he doesn't want any of this to happen, and, and truly, it is an honor to walk alongside warriors like yourself. I believe that there's a difference between a Christian and a Jesus follower. I mean, if you want to do what Jesus did, you've got to know him without a doubt, and he will thoroughly equip you for every good work. I think a lot of people that go to church are living underneath their privileges. They really don't understand the authority that Christ has given them. And I'm here to tell you that we are going to take the city of Crystal, if that's what God has for us, and the surrounding areas by force. We are going to do things. I met with gang members yesterday in South Minneapolis from Chicago. They're telling me that nobody comes down to PV Park and does what you guys, nobody ever comes and thinks about us. Let me tell you something. We're not only going to South Minneapolis, we're going to North Minneapolis. We're not even going to North and South. We're going to Chicago. We're going to Milwaukee. We are going to take the love of God throughout this country. It really doesn't come down to a building. We have to get a building, but so much of our church happens outside the building. That's why that particular property gets me excited because we can design that, build it to what we're doing already. But there are no limits to God. That's yet just another step in the right direction through his authority and his power. But it's not just in me and it's not just in the elders. It's just not just in the praise. Let's give Jessica a hand. What an anointed girl she is. I mean, the anointing just flows right off of her. And, and, and God is calling you to be part of this. God is calling you to be a part of this. Lord, I ask that you just, just invade this place. Invade this place through your Holy Spirit. Lord, I ask that you begin to shift in Jesus' name our perspectives. Lord, I ask that you cast out the fear that some of us are, are experiencing through your love that will drive it right out the door. Lord, I ask that you change the atmosphere. Lord, that we are more than conquerors in you. Lord, that we are overcomers. Lord, that you can do more in us than you can do in a thousand people. Because you tell when two or three are gathered in my midst, which there's more than two or three here tonight, that you are going to do a mighty work in and through us. Lord, begin to shift the perspectives. Begin to shift the anointing. Begin to shift the attitudes. Begin to shift the generosity. Lord, be, show us the provision, Lord, where we are supposed to walk and we will walk boldly in that direction like never before. Lord, stretch us, mold us, sharpen us. Just chasten us when we need to be corrected and directed. Lord, do a mighty work tonight like never before. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. 
Sometimes, you know, I get tired of doing good. <clears throat> Some of us are not used to doing good for any period of time. And I'm just coming real with it. And, and I, you know, it's, 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 it's okay when Matt says, you know, I was behind on child support. Who's been behind? I mean, that's life. You know, we're not, we're, nobody's judging him. Nobody's doing nothing. We are who we are. And God uses us just as we are. I didn't have to get it all together to come to God. He made me all together once I came to him. Don't wait to get it together to come to the Lord. Last week was absolutely phenomenal as 15 people gave themselves to the Lord. And it all started from this gentleman's courage over here. I met with him before church. I want you to stand up. I'm going to tell you, stand up for a second, my friend. Stand up. Yes, you, you know I'm talking to you. Stand up. Because of your courage, there's 14 other people in heaven today. God is good. Don't ever think that God is not going to use you for a greater purpose. But the key is, we've been learning in the sun stand still, and it absolutely amazes me, you know, in, in, the, in the flesh, but in the spirit it doesn't, because God always confirms. God always confirms. Eric called me up last night. He was so giddy, I'd never seen him. I thought he was 10 years old, and he told me he read that chapter on sun stand still. He had an encounter with one of his customers, because we learned this week that our profession is our pulpit. Our profession is our pulpit. And as we've gone through the first 21 days, I mean, it's like God is just always right on time. It's like he's waiting for us to get there. Now, one thing I've learned about myself, I don't want to get ahead of God and I don't want to get too far behind him. I want to be one step behind him all the time. I want to be so close to him that I can hear him whisper. And that's my prayer for each and every one of us, that we get so close to him that we can hear him whisper. And if you've been following along with us in the sun stand still, day 22 says, what are you afraid of? As I look at the first sentence there, it says, what are you afraid of? And, and it really stopped me in my tracks because the Bible says love casts out fear. The Bible says that God is love. But I think in the majority of my life, as I, I was only a strong starter and I, I was a pretender, not a contender. I was a consumer versus a contributor. I think what I was really afraid of is God, is God really what I hear he is when I go to church on Sundays? Is, does God really have a plan for me like I see him working in that other person? Does God really forgive me? Does God really have a, a purpose for me? Does, does, God, does, does God really have a plan for me? And as, as I look at that, I think a lot of Christians are, are truly really afraid of that. They don't believe either something they have done or something they haven't done that may disqualify them from what the plan that God has for you. Let me tell you something, church. There's nothing that you can do that can dis disqualify you. God will call you. He will equip you. But I'm asking you tonight, what are you afraid of? What is it that you're afraid of? And the Bible is very clear. It says the high cost. Now check out the differentiation of these, these words here. It says the high cost of failure and the higher cost of missed opportunity. That, what that says to me, it says the pain of messing up and the deeper pain of missing out. Making a wrong decision or deciding not to decide at all. See, if you decide not to do it, that's still a decision. Some of us think by being in limbo, we're not deciding. No, if you're in limbo, you've decided to be in limbo. See, I know what it's like to, 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 to miss out. I know what it's like to have a missed opportunity. But, but what it's saying here is so true. Yeah, there's a high cost of failure, but there's even a higher cost of a missed opportunity. About five years ago, I walked away from my profession. I didn't know how we were going to pay our bills, and I began to tithe. And, and when I was tithing, you know, this church wasn't even in existence yet. And I began to just be faithful because I didn't know how it was going to look. And when I reflect back on it, I had a lot of things to be afraid of, but I stuck around the winners. And they taught me about the love of God, and I began to walk one step at a time boldly that God does have a plan for my life. But when I look at that, and there was a mentor in my life at the time, he says, what's the worst that can happen to you? You fail. Some of us are afraid of failure. Some of my failures birthed the great beginnings of something else. But if you never try, you might never fail. See, failure is part of life, and I'm here to tell you, if I wouldn't have failed at that, I wouldn't have been birthed at this. If I wouldn't have failed at that business, I wouldn't have birth the new business. And God is always in the business of recycling. It says, so the pain of messing up or the deeper, say deeper, deeper. of missing out. I don't want to miss out what God is doing. 
you can clearly see that he's doing a lot of stuff here. It says making the wrong decision or deciding not at all. It says falling down or standing still. We talked about the difference between faith and hope last week. I mean, I can hope for a lot of things, but when I'm, hope, when I'm hoping for something, I'm standing still. Faith takes action. We know that faith without works, the Bible says, is dead. And, and that's what it's saying, falling down or standing still. We've decided that often it's better to regret something we did than something we didn't do. If you know what Romans 8.28 says, says that God causes everything to work together for the good. It doesn't say that everything that does happen to us is good, but it says he'll work it together for the good, for those that are called according to his purpose and for those who love him. And what did we just learn about love? That love casts out all fear. We need to stop being afraid. We need to walk boldly. We got to understand that we've got the most powerful person in the universe at our side. That's Jesus Christ. And when we got him, you better know him too much about him so you don't doubt him that God has called you to higher heights and deeper depths in him. This is your season to do something on his behalf. It doesn't matter if you fall down, get back up. The unrighteous stay down, the righteous get back up. And I'm here to tell you, it don't matter how many times you fall, how many times you fail, God still has a plan for your life. I can stand here today because of Romans 8.28 and tell you I have no regrets. There's a lot of things I've done in my life that I'm not proud of, but God has recycled every one of those pains into a miracle. And I can be myself around people like you and tell you, you know what, I did mess up. You know what, I did fail. You know what, I, I said something I shouldn't have said. I apologize, but God's still going to use me in spite of me. Don't be afraid to fail. Just don't miss the opportunity. We've got to learn how to maximize our moments, and that's why this book is so powerful. Serving God will cost you something. It says, but there's always such a thing as an opportunity cost, but miss out on if you fail to act. Don't let your fears, worries, self-doubts prevent you from acting that the vision God has given you. See, the thing about vision is that, that God has something for, for you, but you can't see it yet. So every morning you've got to wake up with something that you don't have yet. It's easy to work with something you have, but it's, it's difficult when you have to wake up in the morning and you know it's part of the vision, but it ain't here yet. And you've got to really look at that. And, and, and what keeps us from the things that we cannot see? It's exactly what it's saying. The fears and the worries and the self-doubts. It says the cost of faith is great, but the cost of unbelief is much greater. Luke 19, 20 through 21. Are you hiding what God wants you to invest? I'm here to tell you that God is calling us to invest, and that's where it's talking about the minas here. It says, yet another servant came and said, sir, here is your mina, or mina, whatever it is. I have kept it away. See, a lot of us, if you look at what the Message Bible says, God is not interested in working with people that are afraid to go out on a limb. It's out on the limb is where God is. God isn't in the boat. He didn't come in the boat with Peter. God called Peter out of the boat in the unfamiliar territory. And if you know what it says now in the word, when it comes to the talents and the minus, it says, he, he, God it says, this, take a thousand and give it to the one who risks the most. Get rid of the play it safe who won't go out on a limb. Throw him into utter darkness. Now it says in the, the, the message Bible in the book of Luke, it says, he said, that's what I mean. Risk your life and get more than you ever dreamed of. Play it safe and end up holding the bag. Right in line with what the Proverbs said on the, the giving scripture. I've never held on to something and got rich. What are you holding on to what God wants you to invest? Day 23, the wave jumper, it demonstrates one of the most common patterns in Scripture. As big waves roll towards us, God promises to do the heavy lifting. He's the only one that, that we have faith in to wade as deep as He... How deep is God asking you to wade? How deep is God asking you to go all in? With your time and your talent and your tithe and your priorities... It says, as they come in, it's wait as deep as he leads and keeps reaching up to him. It may be your, jo may be your job to cross over, but it's God's job to see you through. If you do, do the believing, God will do the achieving. See, it's so important to know that not only you are not alone, but you are, the, you are not primarily responsible for the outcome of your obedience. Tonight I'm going to introduce to you as the book, Let Us Down This Trail, that God has a responsibility too. That we're not primarily responsible for our obedience. We're responsible for the effort and God is responsible for the outcome. We're responsible to get up and do something when he says to get up and do something. The final result will be a miracle that he achieves on our behalf. God is ready to do something miraculous in our midst. 
It's so important that you grasp that, that, that we just have to believe. But we know that believing requires action because the Bible says that faith without works is dead. So you can't just believe, you've got to act. And once you believe and you act, God will do the achieving. See, God maximizes things that man can't maximize. And it's so important that we grasp this, that obedience, say obedience. obedience. Your heavenly father has a firm grip on you. His vantage point is way above the water level. He's bigger than you. He's stronger than you. He's got you. It gets even better. When you get down to it, you're not the one holding on to him. He's the one holding on to you. See, the majority of my life, I, I thought I was holding on to God with different things. But if Mike is a representation of God, and, and my job is to hold on to God, look at how that's going to work for me. I'm going to lift God up to my level. It's not how it works. See, so many of us are thinking that we're holding on to God when God is holding on us. But if we reverse the script and we come to the fact that God is the one that's holding on to us. See, what happens to me a lot of the time in my life, I, I try to do this by myself. I try to do it in my own strength. I, I try to lean on my own understanding. I do not trust and acknowledge in Him in all my ways. And my path is always crooked. I never, you know, totally, like He says, do not worry about anything, but in everything through prayer, petition, and thanksgiving. And I, sometimes I don't present my request to Him, and sometimes I don't got a whole lot of peace. But I've come to the understanding that God is the one who does the heavy lifting, that i got to get close to Him. See, sometimes when God grabs me and He does the heavy lifting, I cry around like a baby. I want to get down. But that's not how God works. And that's not how my microphone works. <laughs> but think about how many times we as people try to do the heavy lifting. And when God has us, we squander around like little babies. I had the privilege of having a grandma bring a, a, a two-year-old who has seizures to my house last night and asked us to pray for her. I'm like, you want me to pray for her? Who am I to pray for her? And as we began to put, put the anointing out on the different things, see, things I've learned about God is this, that He does the heavy lifting, but sometimes when I'm in His arms, I, I, I squander and I kick around like a little baby. We all have had kids for the mothers in the house when, when mom or grandma or dad or grandpa or brother or sister pick us up and we begin to have our little hissy fits. Sometimes the best thing to do when you're walking with God is just to be still. Because God is the one that will do the achieving and, and what it says, He's bigger than you. He's stronger than you. Exodus 14, 14 through 16, are you doing your part so God can do His? The Lord will fight for you. You need to be still. A lot of times, church, I think we're fighting when we need to be still and being still when we need to fight. See, I'm not getting any younger. I got I to watch what I swing at. I got to conserve my energy. I got to know when God says be still and I know I need to know when God says fight. And God uses people as he used Moses in this scripture to learn. It says, then the Lord said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Sometimes we're waiting for God when he's waiting for us. And what it says, it says, tell the Israelites to move on. Raise your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide the water so the Israelites can go through the sea on dry ground. See, God uses people to tell you where, where to go. It says day 24, up to here in fear. How many are up to here in fear right now? Just be, be honest. Up to here in fear. And if God is on this, this, this thing and, and I, I'm, I think I'm bigger than God and I'm waiting for God to come up here, that's not how it works. But at the higher even, I, wherever I try to hide, it's like I'm up to here in fear. See, I've learned that God does stuff on my behalf like never before. But I have to let him. I have to let him hold on to me. And that's what it's saying here. It's so important that we grasp this. It says, here's what it comes down to. Fear is the telemarketer. The best strategy is to never even pick up the phone. Fear is always nagging at us. Fear is always calling our name. And, and what it says here is so important in John 14, 27. Whenever you are troubled, where do you find peace? It says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. When I'm troubled, when I'm afraid, where do I go look for peace? Do I go to my wife and ask her why you're not affirming me, why you're not building me up when God is asking me, so when you look at what the Bible says, it says, peace I leave with you. Where did he leave it? He says, I don't give the peace that the world gives that you so often go and search for your happiness in the world. It says, peace I leave with you. But where did he leave it? 
And why do we go somewhere, everywhere else but him to get it? The peace that he left you is inside of you. The peace that he left you is the Holy Spirit. How many times do I kick around like a little child going to, to satisfy and pacify what I think is going to bring me happiness when Jesus said, peace I leave with you. Peace I give you. I do not give as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Do not be afraid. But when I'm troubled and when I'm afraid, it seems like I'm going to look for peace in all the wrong places. And he said very clearly that, you know what, this is a different type of peace. Day 25, connector to the current. To someone who's called a full-time ministry suggests that others are permitted to do part-time ministry. There's no such thing as a part-time Christian and there's no such thing as part-time ministry. So if you're a Christian on Sunday from 6 to 7.30, what are you doing after that? I can't expect a mainline blessing with a sideline commitment. There is no part-time Christianity. There is, there is no thing. I mean, the peace that he left us, you know, God, does, God doesn't work when he says he's going to do something. He doesn't do it when he feels like doing it. He's a God of principle. He does it because he said he was going to do it. His yeses mean yes and his noes mean no and they apply to you. And what it's saying here is it says there is no such thing as part-time ministry. Ephesians says, explains the only job of pastors and teachers is to prepare God's people for their own personal ministry. I want the people of our church to see themselves as marketplace missionaries. Their profession is in their place. You know how many of our clients of our painting and cleaning company have come to this church? Not because I'm doing a Bible spin on my head. Not because I go into the business meeting like this. No, I go in there with me. Just me. The greatest scripture that I can ever tell a person is my life. The greatest scripture that I can ever tell a person is my love. The greatest scripture I can ever tell a person is my attitude. My, the greatest scripture I can tell a person is my perspective. And, 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 and my job as the pastor of this church is to equip you to go into the marketplace, to get it down to South Minneapolis. We're doing all those things. Their profession is the pulpit. They are the image of God within the sphere of influence. If you use the, the sphere of influence that you have, God will give you more influence. Utilize what they have. The Bible says being faithful in the little things, he'll entrust you with more. It says they are connectors to the current of the power of Christ. The grace of Christ flows through them. Have you ever met a person where the love of God just flows through them? You have that opportunity within yourself. Through them in the lives of those they serve. Ephesians 4, 11 and 12. It says, so Christ gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and the teachers. See, do you treat those people as a gift? Do you add to your teachers or take from them? I protect my bishop. I so in, and I'm so grateful that we have a loving church that does the same thing for me. To equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. Day 26, confident humility. Say confident. confident. See, what I've seen in so many different things, it says praying audacious prayers and walking in bold faith obviously take confidence. I think right now some of our confidence is diminishing. I think right now as, as God stretches us to a different place and he's calling us into the, the different arenas, it says, but healthy confidence is born out of genuine humility. The two must work in tandem. Confidence without humility is arrogance. Humility without confidence is timidity. Confidence and humility are both biblical and they are equally essential for a true life of faith. I want to be around confident people, but I'm here to tell you, church, as we go into our new building, I'm just going to get really real with you. Fear is coming up to my eyeballs. And my confidence is decreasing. Is this the right move? Is this where God wants us? What should we do next? I mean, now there's like 100 people didn't show up tonight. Now what do we do? Is it now what do we do or now what is he going to do? Amen. See, we, he, he, he's watching to see what we do. He's watching to see if, if, if he can trust us or not. It's, it's truly about understanding what God can do. It says complete confidence is the competency of Christ matched with sincere humility about oneself. You know what? By myself, I can do nothing, but in Him, I can do everything. That's confidence. I, see, when the I can't start creeping in, 
I can't do this, I can't do that. That's fear. The Bible says that you can do all things through Christ who gives you strength. It says humility about oneself. That's when pride goes before destruction. This is the only formula for authentic, audacious faith. Total reliance on God. Apathy refuses to take a chance. Apathy is you can take it or leave it. See, so many people in, in today's world, in today's church, they'll show up when the job is done and enjoy the finished product. And they will, trust me. But wouldn't you feel better about yourself when that church is built and you help build it? Wouldn't you feel better about yourself when you can put a stake in the game? And that's what this church is doing as we hit these goals. But it goes on to say, it says, arrogance plays you outside God's protective parameters. Some of us get out of our lane. Some of us don't stay in the hedge of protection. Either way, you'll miss out on the action if you're willing, not willing to get in over your head. It says, why me? Why us? Why does God want to do this through us? Why does God want to do this through you? Why are you here? Why is he calling you to invest? Didn't happen last year, and it won't happen next year. The time is now. The time is now. It says, why me? But I remind myself, it really isn't about me. God is working his plan through me, and it could as easily be somebody else. I don't want it to be somebody else. I don't want it to be another church. I don't want it to be another missions team. I don't want it to be any, anybody but us because he's called us to do it. He's called you, which is part of us, to do it. And there's many times I say, why me? And fear comes up to my eyes and my confidence diminishes and what would happen if this doesn't happen. And, and we've got to learn to maximize our moments. I'm here to tell you, church, that this moment will never happen again. This time we have, and if we look at what God is doing and in, in, in what it's saying here, is it, it says in Matthew 8, 8 through 10, confidence comes by being in your set place. The centurion replied, Lord, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. See, I'm not worthy to do this, but God is worthy. Did you ever in your life think that you would be part of something like this? But check out what God is saying here. It says, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof, but just say the word and my servant will be healed. I love being around people that I can just say the word. They don't hem and haw. They don't, you know, afraid to go out on a limb. They're willing to do whatever God has called them to do. It says, for I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes. This one, come, and he comes. I say to this servant, do this and does that. The greatest benefit that's ever happened to me as a person on this planet, as a Christian, as a Jesus follower, I got under somebody else's authority. God uses people. And check out what Jesus is saying here. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed and said to the fine, Truly I tell you, I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. God, you say the word and I'll say the word. I'm under authority. Can, now, now let, let's personalize this for you. How many managers do we got in the house of businesses? How many people used to be managers? Do you think the people that are under you will follow you if you're not following the boss? Do you think people will follow you as a disciple if you're not following authority? See, I mean, I used to be that guy with my lack of character. I, I threw out my opinions on, and I always question everything in my profession. And what it's saying here, it's so important, is day 27, pray like a juggernaut. It says, I hope you're beginning to pray like more both. So say confidence. confidence. Tonight, God is going to give you more confidence. We need more confidence where we're going. It says, hope you're beginning to pray with boldness and more faith. Doug and Mike, please come up here. See, when God begins to stretch you, when God begins to, to ask you to do more things on His behalf, and He begins to pull you like never before. See, when it's only this stretch, there's a lot of wiggle room. But God says, I want more of your time, talent, and tithe. See, God says, I, I, I got a building for you, and he stretches you a little more, and then the fear comes in, and then the confidence goes down, and he says, I, I want you to do this, and I want you to do it for the rest of your life, and he stretches you a little more. But the blessing about getting stretched is the road is real narrow. 
See, my finances are stretched right now. My time is stretched right now. Where I go and where I can't go is stretched. i got to walk a narrow road. Where is God stretching you? See, God stretched us and He showed us a building this week. And then, because of Mother Day and because of people being in Haiti, they were sitting on the floor last week, but this week we're down 100 people. He's stretching us. What do you do when you're stretched? You go back to where you were. Where the road isn't narrow and you got a lot of wiggle room. Where you can still go spend your money wherever you want. You can still go out on Friday night and hit the bar. You can still be a jerk at work on Tuesday. <laughs> but when God stretches you, when God stretches you, there ain't room for that. There ain't room for that. When God stretches you, say, no, give a little more. Give a little more of your time. Well, I can't spend any time with my wife. I want more. God wants more. Let's give him a hand. And we've got to pray, but you know what? It seems as if when I get stretched in this manner, my prayers get weaker. When I get stretched in this manner, my confidence decreases. When I get stretched in this manner, I'm not going boldly like I once did when I had a, a, a wavy path. But, but I've got to learn when God stretches me, my boldness needs to increase with the stretch. My, my, my audacity needs to increase with the stretch. And that's where we are right now as we sit here on this Sunday night. It says it's wrapped up with urgency. It's filled with possibility. For the most of it, it's a whole new way of praying. You know, some of us know how to pray those foxhole prayers. But we need to pray like that every day. It don't matter if fear's up to here. It don't matter if your confidence is going. Pray for confidence. It doesn't matter if you don't know how you're going to pay your bills because you tithe. Because it ain't going to be you paying your bills. It's going to be God paying your bills. We need to pray. And it says, when it comes to standing in God's purposes and promises, why shouldn't we push the limits? Say, push the limits. Aggressively pursue new territory. Prayer in an arena which faith meets God's abilities. And there's never going to be a moment when the audacity of your faith surpasses the capacity of God. See, there isn't a time that this will go in capacity. And God is wanting you to, to stretch you like never before. He wants to take you to areas. And if you look, when this broadens, your reach broadens. You can grab more people. You can bring more people to Christ. You can do things that you've never done before. When God wants you to stretch. God wants you to stretch. God wants you to stretch. Say stretch. stretch. Say stretch again. Stretch. But, but I'm comfortable here. I'm comfortable here. This is, all of, this is the only willing I'm ready to stretch. It's just you. How far can you stretch this? God uses people to stretch you. You can only go so far no matter if you've got long arms or not. You ain't going to stretch this bad boy by yourself. God's got to stretch it. Let God or somebody else take the other end of this handle to stretch you into a different dimension. If you knew how to get to that dimension, you would have already been there. God wants you to stretch. Say stretch. stretch. It's your season to stretch. I don't care what your finances look like. I don't care what my finances I don't care what my calendar looks like. God requires all hands on deck right now. Amen. It don't matter how fearful you are. It don't matter if you ain't got no confidence. Ask God to do it for you. He will do it. So tonight as we close this, When it comes to standing on God's purposes and promises, why shouldn't we push the limits? And there's never going to be a moment when audacity of faith surpasses God's capacity. That's why timid prayers are a waste of time. And they are a misappropriation of our authority. It's time to exercise your authority. It's time to walk in confident humility. It's time to go. It says, this is the confidence, 1 John 5, that we have approaching God. Where has your confidence gone? This is the confidence that we have when approaching God. If we ask anything according to His will, and that's so critical, you've got to come to the realization that God knows what's better for you than you know what's better for you. His will is always better than your will. His thoughts are higher than your thoughts. Say confidence. confidence. 
Well, this is the confidence that, that we have. His will as he hears. And we know that he hears us sometimes. A lot of us, because of our lack of confidence, don't think that God hears us. Whatever we ask, we know we have what we have asked for. My prayer is simply, God, do your will. I trust that his will is better than anything I can dream up. His will is to increase our territory. His will is to stretch us. Tonight I'm going to ask you to build your case. It says reminding of his promises isn't about giving him new information. As a parent, I've promised some things to my kids that I haven't fulfilled. God isn't like me. He's a man that keeps his promises. And some of us had parents that promised us stuff, but they didn't follow through. So now we look at our parents the same way we look at God. Tonight I'm asking you to build your case. It's about experience and transformation by going back to the word of God and recalling his promises, the pattern of his actions, the past, your boldness is stirred. Your desires are aligned with God's purposes. The purposes of God are integrated in the fabric of your faith and the motivations become the same as his motivations. Are your desires the same as his desires? Are your motives the same as his motives? When they are, God will give you anything you ask for. Anything you ask for. It says, by building your case before God, you can approach him with audacious faith. Because your prayer is based on a solid foundation. Lord, I'm low on resources. One time I read in Matthew 14 how you fed over 5,000 people with five loaves and two fish. God, would you multiply that same kind of provision for my family right now? You can pray about any area where you're believing God for the impossible and he has promised to respond. God keeps his promises. Tonight I'm asking you to build your case. God, I'm doing more for you to, than I've ever done. You've got my time, you've got my talent, and you've got my time. I do my best to be obedient. I love you. Lord, I'm asking you, and I'm summoning your power. Show me your strength. What do you need from God? Build your case on this sheet of paper right now. What do you need from God? What do you need from Him? And maybe you're not giving Him your time, talent, time, but maybe you say, God, I'm going to. Build your case. Summon His power tonight. Show off your strength. Our God, as He's done before, some of us fail to recognize that God's already done the thing that He's asked us to do. God, as I, as, I, as I remind you tonight, God, in 1 Chronicles 4.10, God, do for us as you did for Jabez. Jabez called the God of Israel saying, Oh, that you would bless me indeed. God, bless me like you blessed him. Expand my ter er, our territory like you expanded his territory. God, put your hand on me that you would keep me from evil because I'm I, sometimes I get in trouble. That I may not cause pain. So God granted what he requested. What are you requesting? Build your case. What are you doing for God? What do you need him to do for you? Lord, we're doing what you asked us to do. Now I'm going to ask you to do what you said you were going to do. I feel secure in asking you this request that you are expand our territory, that you keep us from evil, that you bless us while you're blessing us. Lord, I can feel it right now in the name of Jesus that you are granting that. You're granting that request and making that provision. Lord, show us where the provision is and we will walk boldly. Lord, I ask you, you told me to give, give, you, give me your life and I gave you my life. Lord, I'm asking you to protect my family along the way. I'm asking you to protect my children, teenage children and my 21-year-old daughter. Lord, I'm asking for health for my parents. I'm building my case with you, Jesus. 
You kept Abraham alive for all those years. Keep my parents alive so they can see the provision of what you have called me to do. Lord, I build my case with you and I stand confidently coming to your throne tonight. Lord, I see hundreds if not thousands of people attending our church. I see our missions around the globe. Lord, I'm building my case with you. I'm calling you on your promise. And if there's anything I need to do differently, convict me quickly. I'm willing to do it. I build my case with you. I've done what you asked me to do. Lord, I'm asking you to do what you said you were going to do in Jesus' name. Tonight, as we prepare for communion, I'm asking you to build your case. And as you come up to get the elements, I want you to put your case on this altar. Because God is ready to honor some of your requests, if not all of them. If you're walking in a place that you've never been, it's time to get bold with God. And to ask Him, God, I'm doing this. I don't even know why I'm doing it, but I'm doing it because I feel you inside of me. I need you to do something for me. I need you to do something for my family. I need you to pay my bills. Lord, I need you to find me a new job. Lord, I need them to go get a building, Lord. I want to be part of this family. Build your case. Get bold. Get confident. Speak as if it already happened. Walk in your victory. Build your case with Jesus. He's not going to lose his reputation over you. It's your season. What is it that you're summoning from God right now? He's going to give it to you. In his time. He's preparing you for it. Build your case. As we come up, our ushers will dismiss you by row and bring, put your case on the altar. And grab the elements and just start to pray because the Holy Spirit is here. And he's about ready to grant some requests. He's going to grant your requests. Believe it.
There is peace at the table of the Lord.
Lord, what I passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took the bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant of my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. I want you to stretch your hands towards this altar. I don't know what your request was. But as we close with this song, How Great Is Our God, I want you to sing with every ounce you have because what you just requested is done. It's done. You might not be able to see it. You might not be able to feel it. But if you really believe him, you will sing this song like it just happened. It just happened. Lord, we boldly, as the pastor of this house, I boldly come to your throne and your altar, and I thank you for honoring these requests. Lord, you are a great God. You are a mighty God. In Jesus' name, we, we just honor these requests. Lord, right now we're going to sing to you and tell you how great you are. Like you just did something so miraculous. Because you, it's not like you just did it. You just did it. Get up here, people, to this altar. Tell them how great he is. And you better believe he just did it. The splendor of a king. Sing it like you believe it. Clothed in man. Majesty, let all the earth rejoice, let all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light, the darkness tries to hide, and trembles at his voice, and trembles at his voice. How great, come on. How great is our God Sing with me How great is our God And all will see how great How great is our God The splendor of a king Come on, sing it The splendor of a king Let all 
all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself. He wraps himself in light. Oh, darkness tries to hide and trembles at his voice. And trembles at his voice. How great! How great!
Lord, you are doing some mighty things. You are great. Thank you for doing what you just did. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.